the Toyota RAV4. It's the world's best-selling SUV and it's come a long way since it started out back in 1994 with 8.53 million sales and five generations of development that's brought us to the Mark V model that we have today. With this first RAV4, Toyota redefined what a car of this kind ought to be. The company didn't follow the usual ladder frame chassis construction then common in the class, but instead launched the first monocoque bodied SUV in the segment, which meant that it was the first one that didn't lurch about alarmingly when shown a corner. Fast forward a quarter of a century to this fifth generation version and once more you find Toyota keen to innovate. Most mid-sized SUVs of this sort prioritise diesel power, but this Japanese brand wanted to set a new standard. Having experimented with a self-charging hybrid engine in final versions of the previous generation model, the company has standardised it here, which makes this car in its own way as much uh, a standard setter as that one was. The RAV4 these days though is, as you can see, a larger, more expensive and more upmarket proposition. Aspirations that the second generation version of 2000, the Mark III model of 2005 and the Mark IV design of 2013 all struggled to justify. This time around though, things look more promising thanks to a sophisticated Lexus-derived drivetrain and platform, plus a sense of quirky style we haven't really seen since the original car of the 90s. Toyota says that the more involving drive dynamics hark back to that contender too. We'll see. What's certain is that this SUV is safer, better equipped and considerably more premium than its direct Mark IV predecessor. Not for nothing is it America's best-selling car. In our market, it's more of an individual choice, but Toyota reckons potentially a very clever one. Are they right? Let's find out. Toyota doesn't make boring cars. Well, it doesn't make them now, anyway. It certainly used to prior to company CEO Akio Toyota's massive shake-up of the brand back in 2014. That change didn't come soon enough to save the previous fourth generation RAV4 from dynamic mundanity. But I'll cut to the chase and tell you that it's made a big difference to this replacement model. Thanks primarily to the provision of an all new GAK platform that's a massive 57% stiffer than the previous one. All of which I'm pleased about because otherwise my expectations here might not have been particularly high. The truth is that the driving experience served up by most mid-sized SUVs is about as engaging as an afternoon spent creosoting your mother-in-law's garden fence. And if to that you add the ponderous extra weight of the hybrid drivetrain that all RAV4s for our market now have to have, you'd think that the portents might not be particularly good. But stiff, sophisticated underpinnings can make quite a difference, as they do here. That chassis provides for a lower centre of gravity, which helps to offset the downsides of the extra weight. And bolted to it is a much improved double wishbone rear suspension setup that delivers cornering composure with supple damping that smooths out all but the nastiest potholes and ruts. Is it all enough to make this RAV4 the engaging steer its 1994 predecessor was? To be fair, that's a big ask. These days this is a much larger and heavier car and it still uses a steering rack that's light on feel and feedback despite recent attempts at improvements. That said though, what's served up here is a big dynamic improvement on the forgettable experience that you got at the wheel in the previous generation model. The car turns keenly into corners at speed and there's less understeer than you'd expect in a car of this kind, plus plenty of traction to power you out at the other side of the turn. Toyota says that this car has been styled to make you want to get in and drive it somewhere. And for the first time in a couple of decades in a RAV4, there's at least now the chance that if you do so here, you might actually rather enjoy the experience. 
While redesigning everything else, the brand's engineers thought they'd revamp the hybrid powertrain too. The fundamentals are the same as they were in the equivalent version of the previous model, a 2.5 litre VVTi power plant using the company's familiar hybrid synergy drive technology. But the company is keen that I should tell you that it's an all new unit, badged the Dynamic Force engine and borrowed from use most recently in the Lexus ES Luxury Saloon that also shares the same GAK platform. A little disappointingly, that doesn't mean you can plug it in to increase the all-electric range, as would be possible, for instance, in a comparably priced but slightly smaller Kia Nero plug-in hybrid SUV. Uh, Toyota has this technology but still hasn't found a way of making it relatively affordable. So the company is continuing with what it likes to call a self-charging hybrid system, though now at least a more efficient one. Using this setup, the normally aspirated power plant runs with both direct and indirect injection, now uses the more efficient Atkinson cycle and is paired to a redesigned epicyclic geared hybrid system. On all models, the Dynamic Force engine puts out 176 brake horsepower, with the rest of the output provided by electrification. The two-wheel drive variant that I'm trying here gets one electric motor uh, mounted on the front axle and puts out a combined total of 215 brake horsepower, enough to allow this version to reach 62 miles an hour from rest in 8.4 seconds on route to 112 miles an hour. Toyota though expects most customers to pay the extra for the all-wheel drive i 4x4 system which adds a further electric motor on the back axle upping total power to 219 brake horsepower and improving the 62 mile an hour sprint time to 8.1 seconds. Okay so the so-called E4 system that creates isn't really a proper 4x4 setup. Uh, for a start it comes with a very pronounced frontward power bias but it'll be enough to deliver the extra winter traction that many owners need. Like all Toyota and Lexus hybrids, this RAV4 can be driven in three ways. By the electric motors only, as is the case from start off for up to 1.2 miles, uh, with just the engine, if you're giving it full throttle, or more usually with a combination of both. During deceleration and under braking, the engine switches off and both electric motors act as high output generators, recovering kinetic energy that automatically recharges the batteries for the next time the hybrid system is able to switch back to electric only mode. So the technology works from an efficiency point of view anyway. Where most Toyota Corporation hybrid products tend to struggle though is in the way they respond under throttle load. The problem lies in the belt driven CVT auto transmission this setup must necessarily be mated to with its arbitrarily placed virtual gear ratios. Even when accelerating quite gently the gearbox sends the revs soaring without much accompaniment in terms of rapid forward motion. Push your right foot down harder and much the same sort of thing happens, though with the added bonus of a straining engine note. Initially, this is frustrating, until you realize that a different driving style is required here. You don't make a hybrid engine go quickly by ramming your right foot to the floor, but by backing off the throttle between ratios in a way that lets the revs drop and the engine bite into its torque curve. Once you understand this, things improve and get better still once you realize that the initially rather dead feel you get when pushing on, on the accelerator can be mitigated by fiddling with mode buttons by the gear lever that include a sport setting as well as the ordinary normal and eco options. These tweak steering and throttle feel along with gear change response, plus you can shift the auto gear lever into a plus and minus zone to take control of the virtual ratios yourself. Unfortunately, Toyota doesn't provide steering column mounted gear change paddles with this engine. With the sport mode activated, the 2.5 litre VVTi engine gathers itself together with a bit more enthusiasm. And the speedometer, which displays with green or white themes in the other modes, switches itself into a red tinged glow. You can't raise your hopes too high in this regard, of course. As usual with hybrids, mid-range torque is pretty terrible. The 221 newton meter figure is about 40% less than the kind of pulling power you get from a comparable two liter diesel. 
Hence this front driven model's pathetic 800 kilogram brake towing capacity. Though to be fair, that does increase to 1,650 kilograms in the all wheel drive I variants. There's hardly any point in using the EV button that's supposed to deliver all electric motoring because the battery runs out of puff in a few hundred yards and won't function at all if the engine's cold or if for some reason the cells haven't been charged up. But hey, look at what this car can give you. In front driven form, an NEDC rated CO2 figure of up to 102 grams per kilometre and a combined WLTP cycle return of over 51 miles to the gallon on green pump fuel. Give it a break. We usually finish any SUV review with a quick summary of off-road ability. Very quick in most cases. Soft roaders of this sort aren't of course intended for the Serengeti. But rather surprisingly this one is quite significantly more capable than any of its predecessors. For a start, ground clearance has risen from 187 to 195 millimetres, which always helps and the all-wheel drive system is a lot more capable than the one used in the previous generation model, now able to direct 30% more torque to the rear wheels. In fact, a greater proportion of it than many mechanical systems deliver. That really helps when pulling away on loose, slippery surfaces, as the all-wheel drive I system automatically distributes torque according to the tractional needs at each axle with a front to rear split that can vary from 100% at the front and zero at the back to up to 20% front and 80% back depending on conditions. Equally important this time round is the addition of a new automatic limited slip differential control on all wheel drive I models. Toyota calls it a trail mode and it's selected via a button on the dash. It deals with the issue that afflicted previous generation all-wheel drive RAV4s which saw a risk of the vehicle being stranded if a driven wheel lost contact with the ground on very uneven terrain. Should this happen when trail mode is activated, the free rotating wheel will be braked while drive torque is directed to the grounded wheel. At the same time, throttle control and the transmission shift pattern will be adapted to help the driver keep the vehicle moving. That's all very reassuring should you end up with this Toyota somewhere you really shouldn't have ventured to in the first place. Probably more relevant to likely buyers is the news that Toyota has significantly updated the range of camera driven safety features it supplies on the RAV4 this time round, courtesy of its standard safety sense package. The pre-collision autonomous braking system now works at night when the majority of accidents happen and can specifically spot errant cyclists as well as other vehicles and more usual obstacles. Plus there's intelligent adaptive cruise control for the kind of highway environment where this car feels quite at home as both engine and electrification combine for efficient progress. At which point you might be excused a smug smile of satisfaction as you cruise alongside the smoky SUVs you could have bought for much the same sort of money. Here's a better way to go, or at least a better way as Toyota sees it. We understand their perspective, you may not. Either way, there's no doubt that this RAV4 is a welcome alternative to the usual class suspects. I want people to love this car, says its chief engineer Yoshikazu Saiki. To like it, to share it on their phones. Is that how the target audience for this fifth generation RAV4 are likely to react to what's served up here? Perhaps. Lower, wider and more angular, it certainly has a degree of character and individuality we haven't seen in RAV4 design since the 1994 original yet it still looks accessible. A RAV4 must never be too big and bulky. Buyers have always looked at one and thought, yes, I could drive that. Yes, I could park it. And yes, that would look rather good in my driveway. So it makes the right kind of statement, especially here at the front where the stance is wider and markedly sportier than before piercing narrow full LED headlamps and slim nostrils above the polygon shaped front grille deliver the overtaking presence that was sorely lacking in the previous generation model. 
Uh, these corner cutouts house the standard front fog lamps, plus the extra volume added to this lower bumper section and this silvered skid plate both re-emphasize this car's SUV credentials. In profile, you notice the Jeep-like squared off wheel arches and perhaps the 10 millimeter reduction in roof height that's come at the same time as an increase in ground clearance and the adoption of larger wheels that can, as here, be up to 18 inches in size. The flanks are dominated by chiseled lines, particularly this prominent crease that flows upwards from the front wheel arch and above the door handles before culminating in the angled rear D-pillar. Privacy glass and black roof rails are standard, and this top dynamic version gets a gloss black finish for the door mirror casings and the roof too. The rear is also cleanly finished, if perhaps not quite as distinctive. All models get this neat roof spoiler with a shark fin style aerial just beyond. And lower down, another silvered skid plate is also standard fit, positioned on this top model below more gloss black finishing, this time for the bumper. Of course, as usual, what's more important is the stuff you can't see. In this case, the stiff, sophisticated new GAK platform that's improved the body rigidity of this fifth generation RAV4 by an impressive 57% and lowered its center of gravity for more dynamic handling. Okay, now let's take a look inside. Despite this slightly increased ride height, it's actually now a little easier to get into because the driver's hip point has been lowered by 15 millimeters. At the wheel, you realize that Toyota's designers are at last starting to grasp the importance of premium feeling cabin quality when it comes to Conquest sales. The brand still has plenty to learn from rivals like Peugeot and Volkswagen in this regard, but it's all a big step forward from the low rent Fisher Price style plastic finishing that the company expected buyers to pay near premium money for in the previous generation model. You really notice this Mark V model's extra interior space and little features like the blue dashboard stitching, a greater proliferation of soft touch surfaces and the leather gear selector make a big difference, as do the improved ergonomics. A further benefit of this car's new GAK platform lies in the way that it allows the instrument panel to be lower set, improving your view ahead. Further helping with this perception of greater sophistication is the new instrument binnacle, which Toyota has chosen to present with a combination of digital and analog design. As in, say, a Renault Kajar, that approach is somewhat limiting in terms of screen configurability. This seven inch central display isn't large enough to show anything other than a speedometer, with an outer perimeter changing in color depending on the driving mode you've chosen but it does have a useful center section that can show fuel economy, compass, audio, and trip computer readouts. As for the analog gauges that flank this display, well, there are fuel and temperature needles on the right and Toyota's usual hybrid system indicator on the left with its normal charge, eco, and power sections. Anything the instrument binnacle can't tell you, and much that it can, is covered off by this 8-inch center dash Toyota Touch 2 infotainment screen. It deals with the usual DAB audio, Bluetooth and online connectivity options, plus if you avoid entry-level trim, there's also navigation too. If you've read reports on this car, you'll have gathered that the brand has been criticized for this setup, which, to some extent, we can understand. The graphics aren't the sharpest, um, you can't have Apple CarPlay or Android Auto smartphone mirroring, uh, there's no back button to help you navigate through the menus, and there's no lower rotary controller, you know, the sort of thing that you get in a rival Mazda CX-5 or a BMW X1 model to help you more easily select screen options without taking your eyes off the road. Having said all that, we vastly prefer this infotainment setup to the much less intuitive Honda Connect system used in this car's closest rival, the CRV Hybrid. 
This monitor is nicely situated directly in your line of sight at the top of the dash and we're pleased that it retains the physical knobs that quite a few rivals make you do without so you're not left trying to stab away at the touch screen. We also like the fact that there's a neat energy monitor showing you at any given time what's being charged or powered by what and an incorporated rear view camera is standard fit across the range which to some extent makes up for the fact that our market isn't being offered the clever rear view mirror that converts into a wide angle camera screen that would have been a good showroom selling point now on the subject of all-round visibility well that's helped by the reasonably commanding driving position and this time around the slim front A pillars, the lower belt line, the larger side windows and a repositioning of the door mirrors. Your view rearward still isn't quite perfect thanks to the thick D pillars but that needn't be an issue as rear parking sensors come as standard on all variants. What else? Well, you've got to like rubberized finishing. It's everywhere from the door pulls to the ventilation dials, even the audio system volume knob, which is quite nice when you're gripping these things in cold conditions and rather Land Rover like. It also helps that everything seems to be very well screwed together and that it's now much easier to find a comfortable driving position thanks to 50% more adjustment for the wheel and uh, plenty of adaptability built into the blue stitched seats that get powered operation further up the range. Talking of the seats, they're reasonably comfortable but you have to stretch quite a way up the lineup if you want to have them fitted out with lumbar support. As for cabin practicality, well there's plenty of it with most of the receptacles lined by shiny rubber matting. You'll most commonly be chucking small objects into this area in front of the gear stick which includes a 12 volt port, an aux in point and a USB socket so that you can charge your phone away from prying eyes two more USB ports are also thoughtfully provided in this deep lidded box between the seats which features this lift out tray. The glove box feels a bit cheap and isn't very big but it's lockable and has a useful narrow open shelf just above it. Toyota has forgotten to put ticket clips in the sun visors but you do get an overhead sunglasses compartment, a stowage area by the driver's right knee, a coin tray near the driving mode button by the gear lever and averagely sized door bins incorporating bottle holders. You also get these twin cup holders between the seats. Right, let's take a seat in the rear. When it comes to space back here, it's important to remember that you get what you don't pay for in the mid-sized SUV class. Buy a really affordable model in this segment, like say a Nissan Qashqai or a Seat Attica, and there really won't be much room at all in the back, which isn't surprising. Models like that are no lengthier than a compact Focus or Golf hatch. In contrast, if you pay the extra for a mid-sized SUV of this Toyota size, it's 4.6 meters long, 206 millimeters longer than a Qashqai, there's proper room for a family. That lower hip point we alluded to earlier, plus a wider opening angle for the doors, makes it easier for parents to lean in and strap down child seats and the like. And once inside, well, we're a little disappointed to find that this bench doesn't slide as it would in rivals like Volkswagen's Tiguan or Audi's Q3, but the backrest reclines for greater comfort on longer journeys and headroom's good too, despite the lower roof line. Thanks to this fifth generation model's extra 30 millimeters of wheelbase length, there's also plenty of room for legs and knees and helped by the 10 millimeter increase in body width, Toyota claims that lateral space between two rear seated occupants has been increased by 40 millimeters too. In other words, there's less chance of a couple of adults digging each other in the ribs. In addition, the notably low transmission tunnel means that it's easier to accommodate a third person should the need arise to. This time round, Toyota has provided rear vents and twin USB ports. Plus, as before, there's a fold down armrest with twin cup holders and there are outer Isofix child seat attachments. 
but there are no individual overhead reading lights. Uh, the door pockets are only just large enough to hold a small bottle, and rather meanly, a seat back pocket is provided only on the left hand side. There's no seven seat option. Few hybrid SUV models offer that. Obviously, for the kind of money Toyota's asking here, you could have a mid-sized SUV with three seating rows, but you'd have to do without hybrid or electrified technology to get it, which, of course, is arguably this Toyota's major selling point. In the past, though, the need to find room to store the hybrid system batteries has compromised boot space in the company's models. Is that the case here? Let's see. It's time to take a look in the boot. At first glance, it looks as if the tailgate glass might lift separately, which would be a strong selling point. Unfortunately, it doesn't, so you have to wait until this powered hatch completes its arthritic perambulation upwards. This uh, feature's standard, providing you avoid entry-level trim, and if you've avoided that base spec, you'll find that it can be activated remotely, which will be useful if you're approaching the car laden down with bags. Once the tailgate's raised, a decently sized 580 litre luggage area is revealed. That's 79 litres more than the previous generation model could offer. To give you some class perspective, that's 83 litres more than you get in a Honda CRV hybrid, and a massive 174 litres more than you get in a Ford Cougar. There's a useful two level deck board that can be reversed when dirty items need to be carried. Look below it and you'll find an area around the spare wheel where small items could be kept out of sight. Plus, thanks to these lift out corner panels, there, uh, you could stow the tonneau cover down here too when it's not in use. Other clever boot area details include a hand grip on the tailgate that can serve as a hanger. And there's a corner compartment on the right with a lift out panel. Toyota hasn't included bag hooks, but you do get a 12 volt socket here on the right and four tie down points. And thanks to the way that the backrest angle can be adjusted, positioning the rear seat more vertically can make quite a lot of difference to what you'll be able to carry, particularly when it comes to things like suitcases on airport runs. We're disappointed though that there's neither a ski hatch or the option of a 40-20-40 split for the rear backrest, nor are there any cargo sidewall catches to save you having to stretch across to the seat shoulders when it's time to fold everything flat. If Toyota really wants this car to be seen as a premium product, it's little touches like that that will make all the difference. And when the rear seat is folded, well, there's no fold flat front passenger seat option to allow for the carriage of really long items. So it's just as well that there's 60 millimeters of extra luggage area length this time around as part of a 1,690 litre total capacity. Now Toyota claims that this car can accommodate a 29 inch mountain bike without any wheels having to be removed. It's just a pity that the area provided isn't quite flat. There's 1,189 litres of space if you only load to the level of the tonneau cover, but that's still enough to take 10 carry-on suitcases, one more than you'd be able to take in that rival CRV hybrid, and two more than you'd be able to carry in a Mazda CX-5. Toyota has never bothered to try and target the most affordable sections of the mid-sized SUV market with this RAV4, and anyway, with the standardization of self-charging hybrid power right across the fifth generation model range, that would have been impossible. Plus, there needs to be some breathing space between this car and the slightly smaller Toyota SUV that slots in below it, the CHR. All of which will hopefully prepare you for RAV4 pricing that now sits in the 30 to 37,000 pound bracket with all variants based around the same five door, five seat body style. The finance packages that most buyers will be using for purchase obviously vary, but from launch tended typically to range in the 270 pound to 310 pound bracket in terms of monthly payments. All RAV4s use the same 2.5 litre VVTi petrol-electric hybrid engine. From launch, there was no plug-in option, 
and Toyota won't offer here the more conventional 2.0-litre petrol turbo power plant it sells in other markets. As for what you can have, well, there are four trim levels. Icon, Design, Excel, or as in this case, Dynamic. Base Icon spec comes only with the front-wheel drive format that'll account for a minority of sales. Otherwise, every trim level offers buyers a choice of either front-wheel drive or, for £2,240 more, the I all-wheel drive 4x4 package that most of them are expected to choose. Now, whichever format you go for, as usual with any hybrid car, you have to have auto transmission. As for where this car fits into the Toyota SUV lineup, well, the 1.8 litre CHR hybrid would cost around £5,000 less, and comparable versions of the more traditionally engineered Land Cruiser 2.8 litre diesel would cost around £10,000 more. As for how this car fits into Toyota's hybrid lineup, well, the brand's other main petrol electric offerings are two family hatchback size models, the Corolla and the Prius, both of which are obviously a bit smaller than what's on offer here. Corolla and Prius hybrids start respectively from just below and from just above the £24,000 mark. The Prius is also available in I all-wheel drive form, but one of those will cost you around £29,000. More relevant, of course, is how this RAV4 fits into the overpopulated mid-sized SUV market segment. Toyota says it's unique, alluding to the fact that no other model in this class has an all-hybrid engine range. But two other apparently very similar competitors do include a self-charging hybrid powertrain option within their model lineups. By far the most direct rival is Honda's CRV Hybrid, which undercuts a comparable RAV4 by around £1,000. But it offers 37 horsepower less, has 83 litres less boot space, uh, and is nothing like as clean as this Toyota, so will be pricier to tax. You'd probably be less inclined to consider the Kia Nero Hybrid, even though it potentially could save you up to around £6,000 on a RAV4. Now that's because the Kia is a slightly smaller SUV with considerably less backseat room and a boot that's a massive 153 litres smaller. It's quite a lot cheaper to run than a RAV4, but then you'd expect it would be, given the use of a much smaller 1.6 litre engine putting out 77 horsepower less. It might be relevant to point out though that RAV4 money would get you the Nero in its more sophisticated plug-in guise or even in its full electric e-Nero form, which in both cases would spell a much greater level of running cost efficiency if you didn't mind having a smaller, less powerful SUV. What else? Well, Toyota's premium Lexus brand uses similar self-charging hybrid technology to that on offer here. That Mark's UX crossover is very similarly priced to a RAV4, but is a slightly smaller car and has a smaller 2.0-litre hybrid engine. The Lexus NX is a more comparably sized thing against a RAV4 and uses a similar 2.5-litre hybrid unit, albeit with older technology, but it's priced from £36,000, so a £6,000 premium over this Toyota. We haven't yet mentioned the best known hybrid model in the mid-sized SUV segment, Mitsubishi's Outlander PHEV. Uh, that's firstly because that Mitsubishi only comes in plug-in form, so is a slightly different proposition. And secondly, because it's vastly more expensive to buy than this Toyota. Uh, prices start at around £37,000 and you get much less interior space. You might also be interested to know that you can get hybrid technology in Korea's mid-sized SUVs, the Kia Sportage and the Hyundai Tucson, but only as part of a diesel hybrid power plant that's not especially clean or economic and is only offered on top of the range models in the 30 to 35,000 pound bracket. If you're not hung up on petrol electric hybrid technology, or simply not convinced by it, then there are, of course, lots of other mid-sized SUV options, nearly all of them diesel-powered. For something of a comparable size to this RAV4, you need to be looking at the larger models in this segment, uh, mid to high-spec versions of cars like the Mazda CX-5, the Volkswagen Tiguan, the Renault Colios, 
and the Jeep Compass would all fall exactly in this RAV4's price span. Bear in mind though that the standard automatic gearbox you get with this Toyota usually costs extra with these models, so remember to factor that in if you're doing price comparisons. Enough. Let's say that you've considered all the options and having done so decided that there's nothing quite like a RAV4. Once you've reached that point, news of generous levels of standard equipment might be enough to sway you Toyota's way. So is that what's provided here? Let's see. As we mentioned earlier, the range kicks off with Icon trim, which gets you 17-inch alloy wheels, parabola LED headlamps, front fog lamps, auto headlights and rain-sensing wipers, roof rails, uh, privacy glass, rear parking sensors, a rear spoiler, uh, and power folding heated mirrors. Plus there are front and rear skid plates, a shark fin style roof antenna, and an alarm immobilizer. Refreshingly, you also get a standard spare wheel, an important SUV feature that many segment rivals make you do without. On the inside, there's dual zone air conditioning, a three spoke leather multifunction steering wheel and an eight inch Toyota Touch 2 multimedia center dash display that incorporates a reversing camera, lets you Bluetooth in your smartphone and provides access to a six speaker DAB stereo system. There's also a drive mode select driving mode system, an auto dimming rear view mirror and reclining rear seats. You can also talk to your dealer about a range of connected services that you'll be able to access via a free downloadable app. These include the kinds of features that you'll find from rival brand apps. Uh, for ex example, uh, send to car navigation, a find my car feature that'll help if you've forgotten where you parked, and a maintenance reminder. Plus Toyota has added a driving analytics section and a last mile guidance feature. Now, getting back to the RAV4 trim lineup, the vast majority of buyers will ignore entry-level icon spec and start their perusal of the range from the next rung up in the trim lineup, design spec, if only to get themselves the option of four-wheel drive. A design trimmed RAV4 gets some significant additions. Larger 18-inch alloy wheels, a powered tailgate, keyless smart entry, front parking sensors, and the addition of navigation to the Toyota Touch 2 center dash infotainment system. If you want to go further, Excel spec adds brighter projector LED headlamps with washers, a windscreen wiper de-icer, heated front seats, a heated steering wheel and Alcantara door trim, plus puddle lights, blue ambient lighting for the front of the cabin and power adjustment, lumbar support and memory settings for the driver's seat, along with some extra camera driven safety features that we'll get into in a minute. Excel buyers also get full leather upholstery, which on request can be swapped from black to either grey or beige. That only leaves the top dynamic variant that we're trying here, identifiable by the gloss black finishing used for its roof, its door mirrors, its bumpers, its rear spoiler and its wheels. Inside at this level, you get black interior headlining and front sports seats, though for some reason the leather they're trimmed with reverts to the synthetic variety. As for extra cost features, well, it's probably worth pointing out that the most significant option package, uh, which bundles together a nine speaker premium JBL audio system and a panoramic surround view camera setup, uh, well, that can only be ordered if you've chosen either Excel or Dynamic spec. If you want a sunroof, there are two choices. Uh, there's a sunroof offered as a standalone extra on Excel or dynamic models, or on those variants, you can have a Ritzia power opening panoramic glass roof. But for that, you have to have also gone for the JBL audio option. Right, what else? Well, you'll almost certainly be paying your dealer more for your choice of paint colour. Only this top dynamic specification gets metallic paint as standard. We've got white pearl here. There are various different 18 inch alloy wheel designs too. It's also possible to add chromed side sills, a chromed rear lower boot garnish, wind deflectors for the side windows and a hood deflector for the bonnet. 
If you want to smarten up the interior, uh, you can upgrade the upholstery on all models. There's a choice of either saddle brown or black with grey or black leather. Uh, there's also a mix of leather and black Alcantara with saddle brown or grey contrast piping and stitching. As for practicalities, well, on XL and dynamic spec models, you can, uh, very unwisely, uh, swap out the standard spare wheel for a tyre repair kit if you want to free up some space beneath the boot floor. You can also add in aluminium scuff plates, uh, textile or rubber floor mats, and an ashtray if you haven't kicked the habit. Uh, for the cargo bay, there's a boot liner, a vertical cargo net, a dog guard, and a rear bumper protection plate. You might also want to pay extra for door handle protection film, side mouldings, front and rear mud flaps, door edge protectors, and a long life bodywork protection package. And of course, you can add the usual roof cross rails that will allow you to add things like roof boxes and bike holders. Enough on options. What about the safety standards of this fifth generation RAV4? Well, they're very high thanks to Toyota's decision to include an upgraded second generation version of its Safety Sense package as standard across the range. Most of the features work via this single lens camera and millimetre wave radar, both embedded here at the top of the windscreen into a unit that's now been made smaller so as to give the driver a wider field of vision. Let's talk you through what's on offer. Probably the key inclusion is the brand's pre-collision system with pedestrian detection autonomous braking setup, now revised so that it works just as well at night or in situations of poor light, which are, after all, the kinds of conditions in which most accidents take place. Uh, here, the system's radar scans the road ahead in search of potential collision hazards as you drive at speeds of between 0 and 112 miles an hour. Like most autonomous braking systems, this one can detect people, animals, solid objects or other vehicles that might stray into your path. And in daylight hours at between 6 and 50 miles an hour, it can specifically detect errant bicycles too. If an Im imminent risk of collision is detected, the pre-collision system will alert the driver and prepare the brakes for maximum pre-collision brake assist stopping force. If the driver fails to act, autonomous emergency braking will be triggered, which can reduce vehicle speed by up to 25 miles an hour, potentially bringing the car to a stop and avoiding an impact. But that's just one of the Safety Sense features. There are quite a few others. Lane departure alert with steering assist, for instance, which lets you know if the car is wandering over road markings, and if it is, will gently apply subtle steering lock to ease you back to where you ought to be in your lane. Then there's RSA road sign assist, which pictures road signs as you pass and displays them on the dash. Automatic high beam dips your headlights for you at night to avoid dazzling oncoming vehicles. And IACC, Intelligent Adaptive Cruise Control, automatically regulates your speed on the highway to maintain a safe gap to the car in front, varying as necessary to suit speed and congestion. The intelligent bit of the IACC system relates to the way that the windscreen camera can recognise new speed limits on major roads and let the driver adjust his or her speed to keep within the limit simply by using switches on the steering wheel. So you need, need never be caught out by a speed camera again, in theory anyway. There's also an e-call emergency system that'll automatically alert the emergency services with your exact GPS location if the airbags go off. In any completely new modern era product of this kind of price these days, you also expect the potential for a degree of autonomous driving support, which this RAV4 provides courtesy of its standard lane tracing assist function. When travelling at speeds above 31 miles an hour, this monitors the line markings on motorways and major routes and applies steering assist to keep the car centred within its lane. This can reduce collision risks and the burden on the driver when making long highway journeys. 
Lane tracing assist is also great for slow stop-go traffic where it works in concert with the intelligent adaptive cruise control system to track the path of the vehicle in the lane ahead, maintaining a safe distance and speed, uh, bringing your car to a halt when necessary and moving this Toyota off seamlessly when the traffic flow resumes. This can relieve a RAV4 driver of much of the stress of driving in slow traffic and significantly reduce the risk of common low-speed rear-end collisions. The RAV4 also gets plenty of more conventional safety kit too. Twin front, side and curtain airbags for example, plus a further airbag for the driver's knees and Isofix child seat mounts on the two outer rear seats. On top of that, there's hill start assist control to prevent the car from rolling backwards as you pull away on steep inclines, plus VSC stability control and the usual ABS braking and traction control systems. Every model in the range also comes with a tyre pressure warning system and trailer sway control to prevent snaking when towing. If you're able to stretch to the plushest XL and dynamic derivatives, your RAV4 will come with two further radar-driven features. Rear cross-traffic alert can detect approaching vehicles and warn you as you reverse out of a bay, while the blind spot monitor works on the move to stop you from dangerously pulling out to overtake when there's a vehicle in your blind spot. This is a self-charging hybrid, which is Toyota's way of saying that you can't plug it in. The only other mid-sized petrol-electric SUV that's really similar to this one is Honda's CR-V hybrid. That car produces very similar fuel economy figures to this one, but is way off in terms of the cleanliness of its CO2 emissions. Some figures will illustrate the point. The two-wheel drive RAV4 I'm trying here would manage up to 51.2 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 102 grams per kilometre if fitted with 17-inch wheels. Switch to the all-wheel drive I RAV4 variant and you're looking at 48.7 miles to the gallon on the WLTP combined cycle and at any DC rated 103 grams per kilometre of CO2. For the CRV hybrid, the CO2 figures vary between 120 and 126 grams per kilometre, depending on the drive format you choose. And that means the Honda suffers significantly in comparison to this Toyota in terms of its benefit in kind tax status. Where a CRV hybrid all wheel drive model has a BIK rating of 26%, for a RAV4 hybrid all wheel drive I variant, it's just 21%. At the time of this test, that meant that over a three-year period of ownership, you'd pay £1,687 more in tax to run that Honda than this Toyota. Quite a difference. A self-charging Kia Niro hybrid, which is nominally an SUV, would be cleaner, more frugal and more tax efficient than both cars. But that's only because that Kia is a smaller, lighter model with a smaller 1.6 litre engine, so isn't really directly comparable. The Nero is also available in plug-in form for around about the same kind of money that you'd need for this RAV4. We think that Toyota's decision not to adopt plug-in technology for this fifth generation RAV4 model's hybrid engine is an interesting one and slightly ironic given that the brand was the first to develop plug-in hybrid engines for automotive use. This engineering hasn't been made available to RAV4 customers because Toyota believes, at least for the time being anyway, that plug-in premium pricing doesn't deliver enough in terms of real-world benefits. Mitsubishi and rival German brands would beg to differ on that issue, pointing out that the lithium-ion batteries of fully charged plug-in hybrids deliver around 25 miles of all-electric motoring, as opposed to the very limited 1.2 mile range you get from the Oldtech nickel metal hydride batteries used in this RAV4. Toyota counters by saying that 25 miles is a hopelessly optimistic figure and that anyway many owners buy plug-in hybrid models for the tax benefits but then never plug them in. Since we'd agree with both perspectives it's difficult to definitively guide you here. Ultimately this is more of a tax issue than an automotive one. 
it really comes down to where there is a potential buyer in the mid-sized SUV segment, you're prepared to pay a significant amount more for plug-in hybrid technology that quite legally artificially distorts the official fuel and CO2 cycle figures to produce lower quoted fuel and CO2 readings that'll then reduce your tax bill. Rival plug-in models do this by starting the WLTP testing procedure fully charged, which is why the stats state that a pricier Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV, for example, can somehow deliver 139 miles to the gallon on the WLTP combined cycle and 46 grams per kilometre of CO2. Read these statistics like that and you'd think that the overall real-world running costs of a RAV4 hybrid would be way behind those of a plug-in hybrid rival. The reality though is we th suspect rather different. Most owners of hybrid SUVs cover more miles on their engines than on their batteries, in which case we think that your real-world returns will probably end up being pretty similar, uh, whatever form of hybrid technology you prefer and the returns in question are, in their way, pretty impressive here. Just how does a 1.7 tonne, 215 brake horsepower, 2.5 litre RAV4 hybrid cost less to run than a 1.2 tonne, 150 horsepower, 1.5 litre petrol powered Ford Focus? Answers on a postcard, please. More importantly, this car will be significantly cheaper to run than the kind of comparably priced, conventionally diesel-powered compact SUV model that you might previously have been considering if you're shopping in this segment. Maybe not when it comes to combined cycle fuel economy, though the hybrid version of this RAV4 gets close to the figures of diesel rivals in that regard. No, we're thinking more in terms of the all-important CO2 reading your tax band will depend upon. Thinking of a conventional diesel-powered model in this sector? Maybe a Mazda CX-5, a Volkswagen Tiguan or a Jeep Compass? Then, if you want a typical 2-litre four-wheel drive diesel package, you'll need to think in terms of a CO2 reading around 40 grams per kilometre dirtier than you'd record in a RAV4 all-wheel drive i hybrid, which of course will translate into much higher benefit-in-kind tax payments. Just to take one example, a RAV4 hybrid all-wheel drive i would, at 2018-2019 taxation rates, cost £4,584 less to tax over three years than a Volkswagen Tiguan 2.0-litre TDI 4 motion. All of that is thanks to clean emissions, though of course, during much of your urban motoring in a RAV4 hybrid, say when you're inching along in traffic with the engine seamlessly disabled, the EV mode activated and battery power in motion, you won't be emitting any emissions at all. You can monitor the hybrid system's cleverness on the energy display you'll find on the centre console monitor, the same display also providing graphical trip information and history screens so that you can gauge your ongoing success in fuel economy and energy regeneration. At higher speeds, you'll need to bear in mind that the quoted fuel figures are even more heavily dependent than normal on the driver assuming a significant degree of restraint. Certainly to get anywhere near uh, even the 40 miles to the gallon mark in day-to-day -day use with this Toyota, you'll need to keep the car locked into the provided eco mode, which moderates throttle response and engine power output while tweaking the climate control. Plus, you'll also need to keep a very careful eye on the hybrid system indicator that replaces the usual rev counter on the dash, making sure that the needle stays as often as possible in either of the blue eco or charge zones. I mentioned earlier that the hybrid synergy drive system used here still utilises relatively old tech nickel metal hydride battery cell technology, but almost everything else about this car's latest powertrain is pretty sophisticated. The battery pack is 11% lighter and its power control unit is more compact. 
energy losses through the transmission have been reduced by 25% and the new dynamic force engine adopts the more efficient Atkinson cycle, uses a longer stroke and operates at a higher compression ratio. Plus it features reduced friction losses over the previous generation 2.5 litre hybrid unit, uses a fully variable oil pump for more efficient engine oil pressure management and achieves an impressively high peak thermal efficiency rating of 41%. If you've chosen the all-wheel drive I variant, you might notice from the efficiency stats I quoted earlier that there's very little fuel and CO2 downside in switching from the two-wheel drive RAV4 to the 4x4 model. That's because the electric all-wheel drive I system used here is more compact and lighter in weight than the mechanical 4x4 setups that rival SUVs use. All of this technology might make you worry about this RAV4 hybrid model's reliability, but the Prius-derived engineering in use here scores very highly in almost every customer satisfaction survey going, and all models are covered by a five-year, 100,000-mile warranty. Though not quite a match for Kia's seven-year deal, this is a notable improvement on the limiting three-year 60,000-mile packages you get from brands like Ford, Vauxhall and Volkswagen in this segment. Unlike earlier Toyota hybrid models, there's no extended warranty for the hybrid components. Early Priuses were covered for up to eight years. However, for an extra outlay, you can guarantee the petrol electric underpinnings for up to 11 years on an unlimited mileage deal. A standard RAV4 buyers get five years of pan-European roadside breakdown assistance, a three-year paint warranty, and 12 years of anti-perforation cover. As for looking after your car, well, routine maintenance is needed every 10,000 miles or 12 months, depending on which comes around soonest. Uh, that may be a little frustrating if you're a higher mileage driver. There's a dedicated My Toyota website that allows you to book a service online and Toyota has a fixed price servicing plan so you'll know in advance exactly how much any work will cost before you check into a dealer. You could also take advantage of the optional prepaid service plan that your dealer will offer at point of purchase, this enabling RAV4 owners to cover the cost of routine maintenance with monthly or one-off payments in advance. However you go about paying for maintenance on a RAV4 hybrid, it shouldn't cost you very much. After all, there's no starter motor or alternator to go wrong, no drive belts to break, a maintenance-free timing chain, uh, no particulate filter to get clogged up with diesel fumes, and of course, thanks to the CVT auto gearbox, no clutch either. The hybrid setup has a good record for minimizing tire wear, and its battery will last the life of the car. Plus, the regenerative braking setup helps extend the life of the brake pads. Over 60,000 miles of driving, the front pads should need replacing only once, while the rear pads and all discs will probably last the full distance of ownership. What else might you need to know? Residual values? Well, they'll be very strong. At present, this Toyota is expected by industry experts CAP to retain around 57% of its new price after three years and 60,000 miles. That's premium brand territory. To give you some perspective, the segment average figure is 49%. On to insurance, and we'll start with the two-wheel drive models. The Icon version is ranked in Group 25. It's Group 26 for the Design and the XL, and Group 27 for this top dynamic variant. For the all-wheel drive i 4x4 derivatives, a Design model is Group 28, and it's Group 30 for the XL and Dynamic. Though opinion may be divided as to whether the original RAV4 invented the soft roading SUV segment, no one doubts that more than any other, this model was the first to define it. In our market, this contender no longer epitomizes this kind of car, but it does now usefully develop the genre that Toyota says it created. No other brand has so much of an overwhelming emphasis on hybrid power, which makes this Japanese maker more in tune with the current environmental zeitgeist than its rivals. That gives this fifth generation RAV4 a key attribute it'll need in such a crowded segment. 
But as later versions of the previous generation model showed, hybrid technology isn't enough on its own to attract the Conquest customers the brand needs. So the additional changes made here are important. The extra space, the higher quality cabin, the better safety provision, and probably most significant of all, the more arresting looks. All of these things will be well received by potential buyers. Some of them though, we think, might struggle a little with the drive characteristics of the hybrid system or the old tech infotainment setup. Some might find it a pity that plug-in technology isn't offered. And customers will probably be also well aware that they're being asked to pay the kind of money that would get them slightly more space and seven seats from more conventional SUVs elsewhere in this segment. But that outlay wouldn't get you hybrid power. And if you bought into that and want a mid-sized SUV, we can see why you might prefer this one to its small band of obvious rivals. Petrol electric engines aren't, of course, the ultimate answer to planet-friendly SUV motoring, but they're certainly a great alternative to smoky diesels for the time being. And one that taxation breaks will richly reward you for choosing. Now, those are boring but important reasons why we might recommend this car to you. Fortunately though, unlike some of its predecessors, this fifth generation RAV4 also has a few more emotive draws. Enough to restore Toyota to prominence in this crucial segment? It'll be interesting to see.